cool hi both um so i'm joined with bella and sophie today to talk about adhd awareness month which is throughout the whole of october and i'm just going to pass over to you both to start off with to talk about your experiences with adhd and and then we'll talk about some questions that staff have sent through to raise awareness about some issues so sophie shall i pass over to you first yeah, sure, that's fine. Um, thanks, Sarah. Uh, it's really nice to be here and have this chat with you and Bella. Uh, Bella and I have previously met to discuss all things ADHD and women. Um, so I'm Sophie Harewood. I'm an operations director at Touchstone. Uh, my experience with ADHD, well, I was diagnosed this January, um, just a couple of months before my 37th birthday. So yeah, many, many years of undiagnosed, untreated ADHD, um, which has been very tough. Um, so that's yeah one key key issue tough being undiagnosed um i think my experience has been that adhd has been missed for me um and probably thought that it was something else um that it was other things other mental health issues or just personality or just being very messy and chaotic um but actually validated that it isn't it's 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 adhd um i won't go into too much detail now because i'm sure that some things will come up in the questions um but thank you it's really really great to be here i'm very excited thanks sophie that's great shall i pass over to you bella yeah brilliant thank you so i'm bella i am part of the your space team as a community well-being development worker um i am currently on the nhs waiting list for my appointment to speak about ADHD and to be told if I do or don't have it. Um, I do have lots of pals who work sort of in, um, let's just say the, the medical field and are very familiar with ADHD. And they, they've said, if you come away without the diagnosis, we will, you know, eat our shoes. There's just no way you haven't got it. Um, yeah, I, as Sophie said it, it's been a struggle um and exactly the same experience almost potential diagnosis of other mental health issues or you know is it that they're just lazy which is the worst one for me personally so yeah it, it's kind of a bit of um, a mishmash of experiences for me but I think as I'm learning more about it and becoming more aware it makes it so much easier, even though I don't yet have that diagnosis. Fab, thanks, Bella. Um, I think that's really great to have the kind of different perspectives of somebody who's recently been diagnosed and someone who's awaiting diagnosis. Um, I think that'll be really helpful in answering those questions as well. Um, so I'm going to move on to the questions that we've been sent through by staff. And the first one is, what is ADHD um, and is it a genetic condition? And I know I just want to flag that I know neither of you are sort of medical experts and you're speaking from experience rather than with authority of having, um, you know, kind of medical background. But um, if you just want to speak from experience and are happy to, can you answer kind of an, that question around what is ADHD and your experiences of that? Yeah. So do you want, want to start? Oh. Yeah, 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 I'll start. Yeah. Um, so ADHD and um, attention de deficit hyperactive disorder um, for a while, it was also known as ADD or at least the, the subtype was so attention deficit disorder um, which I think is still used a bit in the United States um, but not in the UK and um, a lot of women were diagnosed with ADD but you would now be diagnosed with ADHD with inattentive subtype. Um, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a controversial topic because it depends where who you ask in terms of what it is. So some people would say that it's um it's a neurobiological disorder, it's a brain disorder. Um, some people would label it a mental health issue, others with learning a learning disability. Um, like I say, it really depends on what website you go on. But um I don't think it's so much a learning difficulty or disability because it doesn't necessarily impede your ability to learn. Um of course, for some people, it is more difficult um, in school, uh, but it's definitely it's, it's around the brain function, basically. Uh, as for it being genetic, that's also like quite a hot topic. And so uh, there is a link between um, all neurodivergence and genetics. Um, in my family, for example, 
I would bet my life and my cat's life, which is even more significant, on the fact that my dad has um, ADHD. Uh, he's 72. Um, and all the things I disliked about him growing up, I disliked about myself growing up. And now I realise they are related to ADHD. And I feel I really feel for him that he grew up at a time where that wasn't really understood. Um, so, yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that he has it. I, um, I have two sisters who have dyslexia. And I think for that reason, um, perhaps my ADHD was overlooked because I didn't have difficulties at school in subjects I liked. So I wasn't a problem. It was easy. Um, and my eldest sister, I'm 100 percent certain. But I think two, three out of four of us would have it from our behaviours. But also another reason why it would pick up because we we're all the same. And our behaviours were all quite similar, so no one really stood out that much. Um, there is apparently, uh, it's not as simple as saying like one gene causes it. Apparently it's a complicated genetic thing, but also like brain injury can cause it. Um, substance use or alcohol use and pregnancy can cause it in babies or children. And um, being premature also, I was, we were all three weeks premature, but it's obviously not that early. And what's the other one? Um, difficult birth, like complications at birth can have an impact, which obviously impacts to, you know, brain function and maybe lends itself to that categorization. Yeah, I think I think another thing, um, like Sophie said, it, it you know, basically our, our brains work differently, um, which is great in some ways. And it does have its benefits for me personally. Um but it definitely has its its drawbacks as well. Um, executive function is something that I think, especially in females, you will hear a lot of, it, which is basically just doing things and remembering things. And yeah, it, it's 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 challenging. And I think you know, as Sophie was saying, there I was missed when I was in school because I excelled in things like English and kind of creative stuff which you know I did brilliantly and because I loved it and I really enjoyed it when it came to things like maths physics absolutely not and it genuinely doesn't matter how hard I try you know I, I just can't do it I still don't know my timetables I'm in my 40s and now my kids are coming to me saying oh mommy can you help me with my times tables and I'm like no <laughs> I can't. I'd love to, but not going to happen. Um, so, yeah, our brains just work a little bit differently. And I think, you know, obviously that's going to reflect in our our behaviours and, and our feelings. So, yeah. That's all really helpful. Thank you. I was going to say just um, on that question, like we haven't got this on the list, but in terms of like gender differences in um, being spotted at school, like I know that's quite a common thing that boys are spotted quite young often, but it takes yeah. quite a long time until women um, can be diagnosed with it and often it's an adulthood. Do either of you kind mm -hmm. of want to speak on that experience? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in if that's all right, but, but mm. I know Sophie does know a lot more about this than I do. I mean, in boys, you do tend to see, not always, but the majority, they are more hyperactive. So it's, you know, that kid that won't sit still at, at story time on the carpet, um, the ones that maybe love sport, because obviously it involves kind of lots of movement and getting burning off that energy that you you feel you've got. Um I think with with females, it tends to be more. Um, I've forgotten the word, which is hilarious because it's the word classic ADHD moment inattentive. That's the one. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm medicated. That's why. That's the only reason why I could remember it. There will be lots and lots of that from me. I'm sorry. Yeah. But yeah, it's more like the inattentive side. So it's not that we don't want to pay attention. It's that our brain is, is whilst we're trying to concentrate on something and be blinkered, our brain's going, oh, what about this? And da -da -da -da, and you need to do this and you've not sent that email and what you're going to make for dinner. And it's just kind of constant and you get distracted so easily. So that's that that's how I would describe it in layman's terms. But I know Sophie's got you've got more on this, haven't you? Uh, yeah, I just yeah, it's 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 a really interesting, frustrating phenomenon. Um, exactly what Bella was saying, you know, the the classic sort of stereotype of ADHD is the little boy that won't won't sit still, very easy to spot. Um, and everyone went to school with somebody like that, 
you know and will probably think of ADHD like that but yeah exactly for like for example me I was a daydreamer at school um you know often my own little world uh, except similar very similar to Bella in you know art English history the things that I was interested in that's the thing about ADHD when you are interested in something you are really interested in it and you could achieve enormous amounts in that area which is why that's one of the benefits of it um, and that's why people with ADHD make amazing artists leaders in, in some cases you know creative types musicians etc um but yeah, it wasn't a problem that I didn't do well in maths and science, which was the subjects I didn't do well in, because the kind of attitude was, well, you can't be great at everything. Don't worry about it. You know, um, so complete, like I say, I'm completely missed and I wasn't interested. I scraped by, but no one really minded that much. I wasn't causing any kind of disturbance. And I think that's, yeah, that's key. I've heard sort of anecdotally a lot of women, again, around similar age to Bella and myself, a bit younger, being diagnosed after their children have been diagnosed because their children are, you know, are being picked up more effectively in, in schools these days. And then um, they're getting the reports, reading the reports and thinking, oh my God, that's me. Like I, I do that. And then seeking the, uh, which I think is obviously, um, it's great that it comes out at some point. I'm so glad it happened eventually, but it would have been a, so much easier if it happened a lot earlier. Um, and there'd been a lot less trauma and frustration in my life, I think. But um, yeah, especially like around our age group, sort of known as the forgotten generation um and also I think you know things like hormones play a massive part in this as well menopause massive impacts it as well um so yeah there is a big yeah a big gender difference and also I think in terms of the mis misunderstanding of ADHD and the focus on the hyperactive subtype it means that yeah even then there's even less understanding for females as well I think just one last thing I think the the, the thing that I've learned about and I realised that I did it when I was a kid and into some of my adult life with females they tend to mask mm. so they are picking up on behaviours of others that they see as their peers of the same gender and they will kind of almost not parrot it but they will copy so if they see you know their best friend I don't know, like waiting nicely and doing something that someone's told them to, they will kind of copy that behaviour, which then, you know, that it's kind of like um, it, it stops them from being seen, you know. And but I think you don't realise you're doing that behaviour because you just want to fit in, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's the same at work as well. That makes a huge amount of sense to me, yeah. Um, that kind of leads us quite neatly on to the next question, which is, what is the diagnosis pathway like? I know you've both got quite um, interesting experiences of that, so please feel free to share as much or as little as you feel comfortable I, to. But Bella, I think you should start on this one. <laughs> OK. Um, so I, basically, the, the way that I came about going for an appointment with my GP to discuss this was uh, since been a kid I've always felt different um I, di I didn't know how I didn't know why or what was causing me to feel different but I just knew I was different that's the only way I can explain it and you kind of push that to one side because you just think well until something comes up and proves that I am maybe it's just my brain playing tricks on me ironically um and I think I mean, I know that they've seen, the NHS has seen a massive increase since COVID hit because um, we've had more time to be at home and to reflect on ourselves, our behaviours, our patterns, etc. They've seen a huge rise in people coming forward and saying, I think I've got ADHD. So I went to my GP, goodness me, I think it was probably two years ago. Um, he was great he listened he was really understanding one thing that I basically did was I made a list of the reasons why because a it's good to have a list because you know sometimes you know you go to the GP it's stressful the waiting room etc um especially during the pandemic but B as well, as I mentioned about the executive function, you can forget what you're going to say, as I've demonstrated so beautifully already. So I was like, I have to take a list 
because if I don't take a list, I will I will not be able to get my point across. And I really felt like I had one shot to get this right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he listened. I explained it. Um, I explained the reasons why. And he basically said, right, OK, we can refer you. And I was like, great, lovely. He said, it is a long wait, though. And I said, OK. And I think at that point he said about a year, possibly. I said, OK. Then I got a letter through um, basically explaining, probably about eight months later, explaining that due to the pandemic, there'd been you know, a massive delay and a backlog of getting through these appointments and these cases um, and apologising. OK, I received a letter a week ago to again apologise and say basically because of COVID and the, the knock on effects of that, you're now looking, I think it said maybe an additional year and a half to two years from now, I think. But again, memory is one of the things with ADHD, so I'm hoping I'm remembering that correctly. I, I, I don't financially have what it would take to go private um and if i if i had it i'd absolutely 100% 100% but the appointment i have a friend who's gone private um and it was great but when you go private it's not just the appointment you pay for you then have to um if they try you on medication you then have to pay for that and it's not at our let's just say fairly affordable nhs prices I, I'm 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 just waiting and I think if you're in that situation or if you're thinking about going and explaining that you think you may have ADHD I think the best thing you can do if you're going down the NHS route is to educate yourself raise your awareness the people around you um explain to them right look this is what I'm waiting for it, it, may, it may be a no but if I do have it these are the kind of things. Here's some resources if you want to have a look. Um, but then that does take a lot of emotional energy as well, because as Sophie mentioned, that there are so many misconceptions about ADHD and, you know, it does have a kind of stigma attached to it and people use it very loosely in language when they maybe got a bit of energy like, oh, I've got ADHD or whatnot. Um, but I think making sure you've got a good support network around you um, I'm very fortunate to have some friends that do have ADHD diagnosis and they completely get it. And when we meet up and talk, it's chaos because we're just talking over each other and but then jumping and skipping between subjects, but having a wonderful time. So, yeah, that's my experience. And I'm I'm all right with that. I'm OK with that. Thank you. Thanks, Bella. That's really interesting to hear and I think really helpful. I'll bring that back up in the next question, but um, in terms of, I guess, managing the ADHD before it's diagnosed, like in speaking to your friends and people around you, I think that's really helpful advice for people. Um, Sophie, did you want to add anything to that kind of in terms of the diagnosis pathway? Yeah, definitely. So I went to the I went the private route. So I think it's important to yeah um, flag what that looks like. Um, I think so many people have said to me, oh, I want to get a diagnosis. I can't wait, but I can't. I don't have the money. I didn't have the money. I've now got three thousand pounds on a credit card for the, con the assessment. Uh, Bella mentions the medication. I was paying 86 pounds a month for a few months for different. Yeah, different prescriptions before it moved over to my GP. And every time I changed my medication dose to get it right, I paid the 215 pounds for a Zoom call with my consultant so it racked up um, and at that point I had to make a decision about you know what's more important and the pro one of the things of ADHD is you can be very very impulsive I've spent money on credit cards over the years for far less important things and helpful things so it didn't take me long from the point of thinking my life's unmanageable I really need to do something about this to book in an appointment um, with the clinic but I didn't wait that long. I waited longer than I would have done because um, I wanted to have a female consultant. I wanted to talk as openly as I wanted to around hormones and etc. And that seat was important to me. So I think because of that, there were less appointments. There were less female um, consultants. I waited two months. Um, 
but like I say, that would have been shorter if I'd have been with a male doctor. Um, but I think there, it, there it is less available now because more and more people are aware of learning about ADHD and the misconceptions and therefore realising that their behaviours and experiences are very likely inattentive ADHD, especially women, and who are then going to the GP, finding out how long it is, going private. So more and more people are just, you know, going forward to try and be assessed. Um, so yeah, for that reason, it may be slightly longer, but obviously comparatively, it's a completely different world. Um, but yeah, I would rather not have that debt, certainly, but I needed to do that at that point in my life. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I think really helpful to hear the contrast between the NHS and private for people to be able to make informed decisions based on their own experiences. Bella, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think it is a bit of a postcode lottery, though, because I know of people um, who don't live in the same area as I do. And they literally went to the GP on the Monday and they got a letter through within a couple of weeks saying, right, your appointment will be in a month's time. So it's it's not always as long as 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 my experience is. So I'd say definitely don't let that put you off. Um and, and it's the final hurdle almost, isn't it? So I think if you if you are prepared to wait for a little bit and you can't financially do the private route, I'd I'd yeah, I'd recommend it. And just check out, you can check out the the wait times. Um, I'm not sure where the link is, but I have seen that you can find out how long the wait times are if you want to in advance. So, yeah. That's great. Thanks, Bella. And I think as well, um, when we send this out, we'll put some information. So if we find that kind of link for waiting times, we can share that with everybody. Um, just in terms of not being put off, because I know that's something you're quite keen to kind of emphasise. Um, one question is from an anon anonymous member of staff. Um, it's a woman in her 40s and she says she's quite daunted by the lengthy process of um, going to diagnosis and is often being dismissed by GPs um, and wanted to ask for a how did you manage your expectations around the process in terms of diagnosis which you've kind of touched on a bit already Bella um, and also what are the benefits for you I guess this would be more a question for you Sophie of having a diagnosis now like are there benefits to your life of having that? Yeah so managing expectations around it I, I just well, first of all, going to speaking about the GPs and, and being quite dismissive, when I mentioned that I got an appointment with a doctor to actually speak about the possibility of me having ADHD, I'd requested a specific doctor because of my experiences with other doctors and other issues, especially around mental health. Um, I did have sort of quite a negative experience. Um, a, a while ago but that I saw a female GP I explained I was feeling incredibly low um I do have a history of depression and anxiety and I was in a dip and I just really wasn't feeling very good and she was in yeah needed training let's just say that um so I think it's about finding your doctor that either has uh, and this might be tricky but has the most empathy and sometimes I think you can sense that from a GP, whether they're just going through the motions or whether they are genuinely interested in the patient themselves as a person. Um, so, yeah, pick pick your doctor. And you know what? Even if you go in there and the, the, they're like, well, no, you know, or the dismissive, the, the first thing I'd say is to kind of be firm and and say you know I appreciate as a professional what you're saying however nobody knows me like me and this is causing my life problems and I think that's one of the things that that GPs are looking for if it causes you issues in your life then that you know they have to do something about that um but yeah, even if the GP, after being a bit firmer and explaining that it is causing issues in your life, you can get a second opinion. You know, there's no there's no problem with going back and speaking to another GP. Um, but yeah, managing my expectations, as I say, it's just about learning 
as much as you are comfortable learning about it, some it can be quite overwhelming when you're reading lots of different things. Sometimes you read a site that's from the States and it says something completely different to UK sites. Um, but then on the flip side, that there's communities out there that you can lean on for support and it can be completely anonymous. You can just pop a username in and you can just speak with people um, and see if their experiences match yours or if they have any further advice too. But managing your expectations, I just think it's about looking after yourself. It really is about, and I know it's such a cliche, but self-care and trying to nurture you as if you were someone that you really, really cared about. Because I know a lot of people struggle with a uh, with ADHD with self care, and I think it's just about being realistic and looking after yourself. That that's literally it. Sorry, I was on mute then. Um, I really love that phrase, trying to look after you and nurture you as if you're someone you really really care about. I think that's so applicable to so many different things. I think that's really beautiful. Um. Sophie, did you want to chime in on um, the benefits of having a diagnosis? So, yeah. Yes, certainly. Um, I think, first of all, the biggest benefit for me was the validation. Uh, it was huge. And um, I think because of the nature of the, the presentation I have, but also the job that I have and the lifestyle I have, I was it was disregarded a lot by my family, um, by not so much colleagues at Touchstone, but in, in general, friends, just like really dismissive, um, not from a place of wanting to be unkind, but of a, pla a place of ignorance ultimately. Um, and I just had so much, like, oh no, you can't possibly have ADHD. How could you have ADHD and do your job? Well, let me tell you, it is a struggle every single day Every single meeting, regardless of the treatment, it's still a struggle. And all the years without all of that was also a struggle. So it was really great. And I remember doing like a post about it. Um, I think it was on Instagram because um, I wanted to share, especially as a woman, I wanted to sort of say, don't like sit on this. There's, there's an answer. Um, and, you know, I remember th people thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm really, I'm really, really surprised. I wouldn't have thought really think you have ADHD and I was like oh, you know it's, it's interesting that you're surprised because one of the leading consultants in the UK wasn't surprised at all um, that I have ADHD in fact you know could clearly tell from what I was telling her so um you know and you kind of I think it's I've, I've left any resentment around that behind now because I think it is again about people's misconceptions but don't I mean of course talk about it but your family and your friends and your colleagues, they're not specialists on ADHD. GPs are very far from specialists on ADHD. It's very, very misunderstood, even in the medical profession. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's seeking out the proper support. So, yeah, validation, definitely, for myself. I also just felt this wave of relief that I wasn't a terrible person who couldn't keep their house clean, couldn't do laundry, couldn't look after anything effectively do you know what I mean like use so much energy and so much willpower to get through work and then go home to a house that looks like it's been bombed you know it's just that's my reality you know taking 10-15 minutes to get out the door in the morning because I think I've left something behind or you know it and that's still my reality because my medication doesn't cook in until I start driving to work so I'm still scattered as I call it completely scattered and I'll be scattered again in a few hours um so yeah also, obviously, it's a pathway to treatment. Ultimately, that's the biggest benefit of it for me, I guess, um, that you can actually access treatment um, for it, like medical uh, medicines, rather. That's definitely, definitely it. And you get to, yeah, you 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 can't be disregarded or or, or doubted in the way that you are when you're waiting or or questioning. Um, and that's a really difficult place to be in as well. And especially if you have ADHD, you're probably spending a lot of time reading about ADHD as well and Googling it and TikToking it and YouTubing it and all those things, because we love a rabbit hole and we'll go down that rabbit hole and torture ourselves, <laughs> wondering if we do or don't have it. So, yeah, you can stop the torture and just start on some other rabbit hole, which I did shortly afterwards. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear. And like, obviously, you would never be a terrible person for not being able to keep your house tidy. But just useful to have the validation to understand where that kind of thing comes from, I guess, is so important. Yeah. And yeah. 
I'm happy to share with both you and the viewers at home. You know, like <laughs> literally my my divorce paperwork, um, my ex-wife um sued me for unreasonable behavior and the 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 list of was not cleaning the house not keeping anything tidy um looking at my phone all the time distractibility now i'm not trying to paint her as a villain we talked about those things because in this country you don't have a no blame divorce so we had to decide but mm. For her, those things were absolutely torturous being in a marriage with me. And I, I mm. definitely feel for her because I was very difficult to live with. And I know now because I live with me and I'm very difficult to live with. You know, um, I'm very nice and I'm very kind and I try and I overcompensate on other things. Um, and she very famously, what did she say? What's well, so funny, but well, it's very hurtful. But at the time she said, um, Sophie's great at a grand gesture, but don't expect her to do the washing up. And for me, you know, that was my my love language was, you know, planning elaborate um, surprise visits to a zoo or whatever with loads of different like drawings and, you know, really go down this massive rabbit hole doing this thing. But all she wanted me to do was do my fair share of the household chores and I could not do it and I didn't understand why. Mm -hmm. And to be fair to her, it wasn't until I lived on my own and I was living with the reality of it that I actually looked into what on earth was wrong mm -hmm. because it couldn't it couldn't be just I don't like it. Because I just physically could not do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think I think th this is the thing. I think a lot of the time the misconception of ADHD is it is kind of like a, a throwaway thing. It's oh, you've got energy or you don't concentrate. And 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 the people don't understand, like Sophie said, you know, the massive impact it has not just on on you know your working life or studying or whatnot but relationships you know even relationships with with my kids you know they'll ask me to to watch I don't know a dance or something they've done my brain's just like blah, blah, blah. and you know they're like mommy why aren't you watching and it's not that I don't want to well I don't want to watch it the 80th time but it's not that I don't want to watch it's just that my brain's like nope and it, it takes me somewhere else. So I think it's so important this month to to do this and let people know about the, the genuine real impact that's happening every day to, to you know, could be your colleagues, your family members, friends. Um, yeah, that's so interesting and helpful to hear. Um, on that, the next question is, what is it like living with ADHD? So I guess you've already started talking about that. Is there anything else you'd like to elaborate on? I'd just like to validate what Sophie said about things like washing up, tidying, um, keeping stuff uncluttered. Uh, my, my husband, God love him, he needs a medal, a hug, something. Um, he's a very, very tidy person. Everything kind of has its place and he can't mm -hmm. relax um, unless a room is tidy. So if he wants to watch the telly and um, let's say if we're having dinner, if there's, for example, like what I've got here, so a random pencil case, there's my kid's toothbrush, um, there's just random stuff about he cannot relax. And I don't understand that because I'm like, oh, it's just stuff. You know, we're looking at the telly. We're not looking at that. And it's literally a processing thing where we it, and, and to try and live side by side with one person that's very tidy and one person that really isn't at all and it's not that they don't want to be mm. they like tidy places but they f they can't do it. It, it it's a complete feel it's like a tsunami of being overwhelmed it completely floods you it's a physical reaction it's an emotional reaction. It, it's a mental reaction. It's very hard to explain to someone because, who hasn't got ADHD because people who haven't got ADHD see a full sink and they think, oh, that's full. I'm going to empty that. I'll load the dishwasher, clean it, whatever. Someone with the ADHD, even if they get to the point where they're like, right, I'll put my gloves on, hot water, blah, 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 this, that and the other. Um, they'll get through a bit maybe and this isn't everyone this is maybe just me possibly they'll get through a bit and then their eye will catch something on the side and they'll be like huh I was looking for that right okay I'll just go and move that over there and then they'll take it and put it in the place that it's meant to be 
but on the way to taking it they'll see something else and they'll get distracted by that and then you know the whole day's gone and you've still got a full sink of dishes but you don't even realize that you've not done them that's yeah yeah I went off on a bit of a rabbit hole myself there sorry about that that's good it's good um yeah no really good um Sophie do you want to add anything yeah so this is the what is it like living with ADHD it's incredibly hard it, it's hard work day in day all the time um it's definitely harder without a diagnosis and without treatment for me it was harder because I was like what is what is the deal with me because as Bella said I always knew there was something different about me when I grew up and realized I was gay I thought that was it but then it wasn't and then when I went into recovery I thought it was because I was an alcoholic but that wasn't it either it's because I've had ADHD um which I also think is a massive link to my experiences with addiction anyway a very busy brain um that you want to calm down and when I think also I'm, I'm jumping around here, this is what I do from subject to subject. But earlier on the question about what is ADHD, a, a big link is also a lack of dopamine in your brain um, caused by having too many transmitters in your brain, which so you don't get the right levels of dopamine. So I think I spent my whole life um, since I was really little wanting to feel better, um, wanting to sort of self-soothe with food or um, as I got older, you know, drugs, alcohol, whatever, um, that seeking, pleasure seeking, impulsive pleasure seeking is really, really big for people with ADHD. Um, and obviously the impulse control is un, in, uh, unhelpful for that also. Um, so yeah, not doing something impulsively is still quite difficult. Um, I think for me, the biggest the biggest problem is, is the house stuff, definitely, because I am completely overwhelmed by household tasks and then I'm also enormously, enormously stressed by messy spaces. So it's just a horrible catch 22 and it's taking a long time. I've now been, what is it? So seven months with, with medication, um, most of which gets used up working more effectively at, at work. Um, by the time I get home at night, usually everything's worn off. Um, so I don't, you know, sometimes at weekends I'll, I'll think, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this and it, there's a lot of unrealistic goal setting with ADHD a lot of putting pressure on yourself a lot of focus on this I'm going to do this today and then of course you don't do that today um so that's difficult um you need a lot of compassion from the people around you that is really really helpful but I would say that living with ADHD is a lot easier once you know you have ADHD because I will do I will think something or an idea will come to my head and I'll be like aha that's the xyz you can make a choice um, before making an impulsive decision. Um, but yeah, it's it's a, it's very, very challenging. Um, there are some good bits, um, which I know is a, is a, is a later question. Um, I, I don't think I'd change it now. I have to accept myself as I am and there are some benefits. And I, and I also think I have hope that I can learn more and more sort of hacks for it because I've already started to do that and there are ways around certain things for sure please send me these hacks yeah <laughs> i'll tell please. you about the hacks yeah yeah amazing i would love that because <laughs> like you said for, i think for me not being able to switch off my brain is constant it sounds uh, people just ev everything i can't go for example into a cafe if I'm, I'm sat with my husband and we're having a I don't know, cup of tea or whatever, I will be picking up on, not purposely, the conversations of the people around me, watching every single person that goes past, interactions. And even though I can hear everything he's saying, my brain isn't focusing. And then trying to mask that by really trying to look at the person that is in front of you, that's tiring. So by the end of the day, I am done, you know. Um, and like Sophie said, you know, I've I struggled in the past with sort of, you know, wine helped me, I thought, kind of quieten that brain. And and it, it worked for a short period of time, but then obviously there's all the other stuff that comes with that, which, you know, which lowers your dopamine and, you know, your serotonin. And we all know, we all know. Um, but yeah, it's a really, it, it's like being trapped in, I guess, a pit 
where you can get out but if you get out that this it's fire everywhere it's you just you kind of stuck in like you said a catch-22 life with adhd is catch-22 completely yeah while we're talking about this i guess maybe it's just good to go on to the positive things or the things that if there are things that you feel like are the good things about your experiences with adhd um I know that's a later question listed, but I think that as you brought it up, Sophie, it could be quite nice to delve into now. Yeah. Bella, have you got anything you want to talk about before I launch into a positive? Monologue? Mm. No, 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 absolutely. Um, so, yeah, for me, the positives are... Um, what positive? I think it makes you a more empathetic person for me these are just my experiences everyone is completely different but for me I think it makes me a more empathetic person I'm more aware of the people surrounding me uh, things like body language tone of voice um, as well as the words that are coming out so I think when it comes to active listening even though you are kind of distracted it, it does make me better at that um, I can multitask well really really well when I'm focused I I can I can do six sometimes seven things at a time depending on what the project is or or whatnot and I know I can deliver I know I can like overachieve and I do put a lot of that down to my ADHD um oh it felt weird saying my ADHD um yeah so I think that those two are the the benefits for me and I'm, I'm trying to think of others I think I think do you know what the the other benefit is the people that I've met through ADHD because they have ADHD that that's a huge benefit um and I I don't think I wouldn't change me because it's me and I would then be starting from scratch. So I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change. So if you've got any, any good bits to add? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I would echo what Bella said about the compassion. Um, that is, yeah, massive. And also I think there is something in the, around the ADHD, around having that um, empathy, picking up on things. Um, being very emotionally intelligent which is something that is more difficult with other types of neurodivergence um, reading social cues um, I'm happiest around people I like talking a lot you know this is the favorite bit of my job this sort of stuff talking to people and exploring things um, the benefit of hyper focus is real so Bella mentioned executive functioning. Um, that is my biggest challenge. So, well, object permanence is my other one. I've, if I don't see something, I don't. It doesn't exist in my brain. Forget about it. I leave it somewhere. I have no idea. It is I spend a lot of time looking for things that I've lost at work. I do it all the time. I drive my colleagues just to distraction. It's a nightmare. Um, but when I'm not being an ops director at Touchstone, I'm a graphite artist, and when I am in that zone or I have an idea of what I want to do I can I will sit and draw for hours and hours and hours and around me I will stop to eat and sleep and, you know, and bathe or whatever but all around me the house the chaos continues to build and build where I don't look after anything but I will focus and I don't think if I didn't have that ability to do that my brain didn't work like that I wouldn't have the results that I have with it because I wouldn't have practiced so much and wouldn't have got better and it is a really pleasurable thing. The flip side is that when I'm working on something, I'm excited by it and I want to be doing it. And I'll get up at six, half five, six in the morning and start drawing. And then it's half seven and I really have to get in the shower to get to work on time. And, my, and I am fighting with myself. And I know everyone will be thinking, well, yeah, but I do that. Like no one wants to get out of bed. But it's like a clash of the titans. You know you need to stop doing this thing, but you just don't want to. It's so hard to stop. Um, and I also think my hyper focus comes out in other ways. And in a way, I think I'm quite childlike in many ways with this. And there's really small things that I find really amazing that I think a lot of people miss because they're too busy just living a normal, living a normal life and not going down that rabbit hole. Um, but not that long ago, I went down a rabbit hole of learning all the capital cities in Africa 
I think Sarah, I think I've been speaking to this. One of my goals in life is to learn all the capital cities of the world. Asia and Europe have got down, but I was working on Africa. And I came, I decided that what I was going to do was I was going to paint one of my walls in my house as a blackboard and then draw a map. And, and this all happened and it's still up there. And it's kind of just like, well, that's kind of fun, isn't it? Like it's good for a pub quiz as well. But, um, you know, these things will last not that long. Um, but over the years, my collection of hyper focuses and interests have created quite a well-rounded knowledge base to, to, to draw upon. Um, but yeah, I'm a massive, uh, I love animals, feel very connected to animals and learning about and being with animals. I don't know if that's to do with my ADHD brain or not, but yeah, small things like got train journeys, love a train journey, little things that other people are like, oh God, you, you're, you're easily pleased, aren't you? And it's like, yeah, I am. I mean, easily overwhelmed, definitely. But I think other things that other people don't, don't phase them, but other things that don't please them that really, really, really please me. So that's a benefit, I think. I don't think I've ever nodded my head so much in a <laughs> two-minute period in my entire life. <laughs> That's so nice that you can both relate to each other though and I think you know it can definitely both the test from my experience with you that you're both very empathetic compassionate seeming people and if that is related to your experiences of ADHD that's a very lovely benefit. Um, I was going to ask as well but this isn't on the list so if you don't if you're not quite sure what to answer or whatever it's a bit of a curveball but because you were both speaking about how difficult it is to kind of once you've done your work day or you like you kind of be and you know your medication for example with Sophie has worn off um you spent a lot of time masking Bella as you spoke about with going to the the coffee shop with your husband um do you have kind of ideas around how society can be or the structural changes that you would like to see that would make it easier for people with neurodiversities to kind of function because I guess this is obviously a big question if you don't have any thoughts that's fine but um I guess like the idea that you're being the people that have to kind of change your behavior and work really hard to get through the day um it seems like there could be some real beneficial changes that could happen so that's not the case I I if I can jump in is that all right so okay mm, um, so I recently popped in my oh gosh I think it was in my one-to-one -one or something I, did, I kind of typed the document up and it was explaining about um how again like Sophie I love being around people and you know picking up on that energy and I'm super excitable just in case it hasn't come across um I get really excited about new projects or ideas or taking the lead on something and the hyper focus etc but the the gets to a point where I do get overwhelmed and I feel like everything's gone and when that happens I need to be like alone and it is not a reflection on other people. It's not a reflection on my colleagues or, you know, whoever it may be. I just need time by myself. And it doesn't have to be long. It can be five minutes. I can just go outside and kind of breathe and, you know, listen to a bit of nature or road traffic, whatever. And then I'm fine. Then I can go back in and then it's like my energy is restored. So I think if you've got someone who kind of disappears and comes back, just be... I guess wary of the fact that you know that no one's done anything they just might need that space um the other thing I would say would be like free earplugs um because I do feel so much calmer and just more together when I've got kind of not as much noise going on around me but again that's my journey everyone's completely different but noise does overwhelm me if there's lots of people talking and other kind of background noise as well you know the, everything's just too much then um but ask I think that's the thing I'd, I'd say generally don't don't be afraid to ask because if you ask someone with ADHD you know what can I do to make your day easier that they will absolutely tell you um absolutely 100 percent. yeah <laughs> definitely um obviously like you say so it's a big it's a big question but i was thinking about something similar myself this morning because i think you know the problem is where with with the label and with is it's the idea is that this is this is other you know um and you know you have neurotypical 
uh, and then you have neurodivergent, you know, um, just like you have heteronormative and then you have other things, you know, what it is to be uh, normal. Um, I think a better understanding of just different types of brains would be good from an early age. So not just sort of being able to diagnose children who are other earlier, but educate all children. Um, and I, like I say, it, it didn't impact me as much as a child because I, you know, but I think being led by them in terms of what how lessons could be structured to be more useful or accessible. I think for me, there's some things that there's no getting away from that I need. The treatment makes a big difference. So, for example, um, I can be in a meeting and I can when I'm medicated and I can listen and take everything in and I can remember what's been said a lot better before then. I spent a really large amount of time in meetings trying really hard not to wander off in my head and thinking I was going to get in trouble for like feeling like people going like, to work me out. I was going to get caught out not listening um, and I didn't realise, you know, I kept trying and that was at school too. But even in meetings, you know, a year ago that was happening, um, which is obviously also really stressful in our kind of work. It's important that we know what is going on in the world in our, you know, so that was hard. Um, so I think I there's not much you can do about that in terms of you're always going to have to communicate with people. So I do think that having the treatment to be able to do that better is really, really valuable and helpful because it's about your suffering. Um, trying to do certain things, you will suffer. But I think breaking down stigma, education, a bit more understanding that it's, you know, it's about a variance across all types of brains, not just this normal one and this other one. And I also think as a woman, and this is, I mean, God, I'm not going to smash the patriarchy in one one hour video, but, you know, it's about the expectations on women in our society and in many societies in terms of what you need to be to be good or successful. And I think this is particularly problematic for women who have children. Um, this superwoman nonsense that you have to be able to, you know, work, look after your kids, cook, clean, you know, keep house, have hobbies, have a life, look good while you're at it. You know, all these things that are completely unrealistic. You know, I've purposely taken a decision not to have children because I know um, I believe strongly believe that it would impact me to a massive detriment because of how many demands that would add. And I don't want to do it badly, you know, um, and that wasn't an easy decision to make, obviously. Um, but now I find everything up so overwhelming. I can't imagine putting another human into that mix. So I have a huge amount of respect, but also, you know, like I do think it's, you know, it's it's awful for women who are trapped in that. And, and that's for, for neurotypical women, it must be horrendous. But let alone if you, you're neurodivergent or you have ADHD, uh, you know, trying to clear up after all these different people. I just, yeah, it's nightmare, nightmare, definitely. So I think if there was more understanding uh, and less pressure to be a certain way, that would just go a long way. The whole superwoman thing, I, I know people mean it as a compliment, but it, it just kind of feeds into that. I guess that kid who was like excelling in certain subjects and it just puts so you want someone to be empathetic and say gosh you've got a lot on your plate you know do you want a cup of tea or I don't know something just some kind of support but I, I think we need to stop calling each other superwoman it's something that not that I, I'm not saying I, I am by any stretch of the imagination but it's something that people like say to me quite a bit when they say oh how are you doing and I'm like oh well so far today I've done this this had to go got her here blah 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 and they're like oh you're superwoman and I don't I think we should stop that because we're just women you know get, making our way through life and you know yeah it is hard with two kids who are demanding um and a dog and two cats and working full time and yeah it's tough it's tough and I just think people need to have more understanding and and like like Sophie said you know we're I think we're in a shifting period in history if you will where you know women are working more women are more successful because we're we're able to be and I think it's about embracing that and, and not putting these labels on on women absolutely
Yeah, that's really interesting. And something that came to mind while you were speaking about that was kind of like the communality of childcare and like who's doing the childcare and, and how it's often so individualised and um, typically tends to be um, the person who's fulfilling the mother and role kind of doing that bulk of the childcare. Um, yeah, I don't think we've got time to kind of get into that more, but it's a thought that struck me. Um, just on the back of that, there was a question about anyone. So someone who doesn't have ADHD, a colleague, asked what kind of things they specifically can do to support colleagues with ADHD or kind of um, make their workplace a bit more of a comfortable, accessible place for them. Have you got any sort of, I guess, top tips or top asks? I mean, you touched on some Bella in that conversation we just had, but if there's anything you wanted to elaborate on. If it can be an email, don't make it a meeting. That would that's the only one that springs to mind right now. Or don't make it a very long meeting. <laughs> or let us like stand up and move around, give us short bits. And 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 for me, I don't know about Sophie, but I like it when people kind of get to the point when people are just yep. kind of, oh well, I like the information that I can take and understand. And then yeah, but that's just that's me. Again, everyone's different. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think on the back of that, if it can be a phone call or it can wait, don't send an email, please. Please stop. <laughs> stop the emails. Um, just in terms of generally, I think a lot of people are overwhelmed by email traffic. Um, but for my brain as well, and uh, often the emails I'm getting are all things I need to deal with and are quite crucial. It can be something that causes a lot of like oh, overwhelm. So I've spoken to SL this Classic. You know, I've got a very, very supportive team around me and I've, I've said this and we're starting to make changes and everyone feels a little bit like that about emails, you know, um, and, you know, some things do need to be communicated like that, but other things can probably wait. And I think we live in a society where we expect responses immediately um, and it's not realistic. And I think I, I really struggle with that. Um, but it's about my own boundary as well, about being willing to, you know not be liked if I don't get back to somebody within 10 minutes or whatever um but I also expect things quickly so I have to manage that myself like Bella said earlier just ask the questions um don't make assumptions because ADHD will look different as much as Bella and I have so much in common that we're nodding all the time like um not the Churchill dog but we will have you know differences um so and, and I guess what's really important especially if someone's sort of like questioning whether they have ADHD is to not be just not to dismiss them because it's really hard to be invalidated like that. As much as you may know that that person isn't a medical professional, you're you're telling them about a vulnerability that you have, that you feel vulnerable because X, Y, and Z is hard for you. And what you need is to be, you know, heard and acknowledged and not sort of shut down. Um, yeah, and I think checking in with somebody about something like how was how was that? Are you okay? Understanding what's difficult for them. Um, yeah, long long meetings aren't. It's easier now that I'm um, I'm treated or being understanding about mess. Like um, it's like a running joke. Like wherever I go in Touchstone House, I will leave bo usually bo large bottles of sparkling water. I think Dave's got about five in his office. I just go to see him about something and leave, put it down. Then I can't see it, so I forget that it exists, right? And then I say whatever, and then I go. It happens all the time. Um, so yeah, just being understanding if people are a little bit more chaotic. Yeah, just be kind. Right? Just be kind. Yeah, I know me and you and Catherine were talking about that before we came on, Sophie, leaving a trail yeah. behind you. Yeah, I'm like a little yeah. squirrel. I just have to leave <laughs> chaos everywhere. Yeah, it's true. I'm sure it's very lovely chaos in many ways. <laughs> um, just a couple more questions left now. Um, one we've not touched on yet are what options are available for the treatment of ADHD? And that includes, like, do you feel like any lifestyle changes, so including diet, um, Agent, I guess as well does anything within your own life that has changed the way you experience ADHD or made it any better uh so in terms of the treatment options the main treatment option for ADHD is stimulant medication um and we don't have time and I do not have the expertise to explain that in more detail but that's Google is all of our friends especially if you're ADHD um so yeah basically stimulant medication uh in, can Im improve focus attention span distractibility impulse behaviors etc that is the most that's the go-to um which is obviously quite a big deal because 
um, I take, um, well, effectively I take amphetamine every every day. Um, and if I go on holiday, I have to get a special note because I'm taking class A drugs out with me. If I take have a drug test, I will test positive for amphetamine and could get in trouble. Luckily, don't have to have them in SLT meetings. But, you know, it is, you know, significant. And there's a lot of um, tests you have to undergo before you can access that because of obviously increasing heart rate and, and so on. I had a lot of tests, a lot of hoops to jump through before they would give me it as well. But it was life altering, I have to say. Um, I feel a bit sad now because it's kind of like my normal. It's only when I'm when it's really, really worn off and I'm particularly scattered. I just think, how did I used to live like this all the time? Because it's become my baseline now. Um, but that, that is the main course of treatment. A lot of people sort of say, oh, you know, I don't want to take medication. I want to manage it myself. Uh, and that's obviously it's up to the individual. And I think in that case, there's probably a lot more holistic stuff you can look into. Um, but I'm always I'm all about the marginal gains. I'm just like, if you can do everything and and hopefully get the best result then then do that hey and I think in terms of you talk about like lifestyle and diet I don't think any medical issue or any emotional mental health issue can't be improved by exercising and eating well and and that's the same really for me with ADHD it doesn't mean that I do it because I don't want to do it so I don't tend to do it um especially with exercise and my consultant said this to me she said don't think about long term. Don't think about what I can achieve by doing this for X amount of weeks. That's why I used to always go wrong and just try harder, try harder. You have to find the what's in it for me in this moment. Why do I like it thing in whatever exercise you're doing? Um, and food is another one. But what I would say about anyone who's considering taking medication is just is these medications can really impact the way you eat in terms of uh, because they are amphetamines and they have an impact on your appetite. and They decrease it. That's a thing that a lot of people go, oh, yeah, especially women. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it has its moments, but generally it's quite frustrating, um, especially for somebody who doesn't drink alcohol and therefore food is extremely important. Um, but it does. It also picks up as well. Um, but I think for me, I do need to be careful. I don't know if this is about being an addict, um, which is my, you know, my language or having ADHD. But if I like something, I don't just want one of it. I want more and more and more of it. And also the dopamine element is there as well. So with like coffee, I drink too much coffee and I eat too much sugar. I really like both of those things. And I know that if I'm better at like having less of both of those things, my brain is is better. Uh, because obviously if your blood sugar is going up and down and you, you're too caffeinated, it's not good for anybody. So, yeah, eating well and yeah, doing a bit of exercise. But I don't do anything in moderation, I'm afraid. So it's tricky for me. Yeah, same. I completely agree. It's either all or nothing. And my brain's like, well, if you're not going to do it, you know, what's the point? There's absolutely no point in doing it. If you're not going to do it and be the best at it or succeed or do well, don't do it. You know, just give up kind of thing. Um, but I would say find your own form. If you're going down the holistic route, one thing that does kind of help me is, um, you know, like guided meditations. Um, there's an app that I use. And it's completely free and you just find the kind of one that you like to listen to. And it just helps kind of quieten the mind a little bit. But obviously you can't do that 24 seven. You, you have to choose your moments of when of when you do that. And um, but yeah, that's that's what I'd say for me. Diet. Mm, yeah, I, ADHD wise, no, I haven't noticed a difference at all in, in changing my diet. I stopped eating meat, uh, gosh, four or five years ago. Um, and yeah, no. Other things I've noticed change, but not ADHD, no. Thank you. That makes complete sense. And I think like um, by diet, just to clarify, we don't mean that like going on a diet to lose weight, we mean changing the kind of different things you eat, which might affect the kind of different parts of your brain. Um, and really useful, I think, to share that ADHD medication can affect your appetite because while that kind of, yeah, might be um, a thing that people find exciting if they you know feel oppression in like our fat phobic culture but like uh it's obviously a really difficult thing to manage in reality and a thing that a lot of people wouldn't want um yeah thank you that's really helpful to know um and the last couple of questions we've got 
Uh, the biggest question left is what do you think are the most common misconceptions and do you have any thoughts around how we can challenge these misconceptions of ADHD? Uh, Bella, do you want to head off? So, yeah, I think we kind of covered one of them earlier, which is basically ADHD is I, I need to move and run around at a high level constantly. Um, you know, that that stereotypical boy running, jumping, you know, always falling over, getting back up, getting into everything. Um, yeah, that I mean, for me, I I do need to kind of fidget a bit. I, I need to be really like I've been kind of pushing my cuticles back while we've been speaking, but it's off camera, you know, and that that just helps me kind of keep my focus. Um, but yeah, the other thing I think at the moment is that people are some people are, are thinking of it as almost like a fashionable thing, you know, like, oh, God, everyone's getting diagnosed with ADHD now, you know, not you as well type thing. Um, I think that needs to go because. Well, first of all, it, it's hateful. Why would you say that? Um, other misconceptions are that, you know, we, we can't focus at all, which is wrong, basically. Um, we can focus, but it's when we can focus and what on. Uh, and I, I think the most important one for me is that people understand that it's not a choice you can't just switch it on and off again you know it's, it might sound and I feel weird saying it but you know talking about tidying up when I say I can't tidy up I don't mean my legs will not walk over to something and pick it up I mean the function of getting my brain to communicate with the rest of my body and making me giving me the willpower to do that um, you may as well ask me to grow wings and fly. It, 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 it is that that's the only comparison that I can I can think of. Um, yeah, and I can't think of any at the moment. Sophie, what what do you reckon? Yeah, I would echo all of that, especially you know the the hyperactive bit is massive. I think just the understanding that it again it's not a choice. Um, it's not an excuse either. That's the thing. I think people sometimes say, oh, it's just an excuse. You know, when I was young, people were just naughty. It wasn't ADHD or this, whatever. Um, it's not a it's not a choice to explain or, or an excuse to explain certain behaviours. You know, I I can't if if people were to take one thing away from from this today, it would be the understanding that with certain tasks, the the feeling paralysed about starting them and finishing them is is a really real issue and the amount of years that I've spent telling myself to try harder and try and do things in a neurotypical way um just like everyone else does I can do and just try harder and, and research more about about how to do it and find another hack to be able to do it but it doesn't work um it will not work do not tell somebody to try harder support them to find a way that they can do it more effectively you wouldn't tell somebody in a wheelchair to try harder to walk sounds extreme but that's what it comes down to I'm not a woman without willpower I didn't get where I am today without being diagnosed or treated for ADHD but there's only so much and some things just will not work it, it, it's just a reality sadly and we're not lazy I think that's the one that I, you know growing up in the 80s it was like oh you know you're lazy or you're being lazy or just do it why are you being lazy and that word I think uh, I spoke to quite a few other people as well about that word and it actually has quite powerful emotional uh, reaction to it so it, it, it genuinely isn't laziness and it isn't that you w don't want to do it, it it's it, it's an impossible task and mm -hmm. you know even just for a day if you could switch just so someone else could see what it was like that then they'd get it but it's really difficult to understand um yeah, no, I think abolish the word lazy in general. It's so, it's such an ableist language and used so often against people with neurodivergent diversities and also um, mental health issues and all kinds of kind of disabilities. Um, yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, and I mean, if I if I could be somebody who uh, could keep their house clean and didn't find it difficult to clean and tidy and could do it my god would I do it I would I would genuinely do it if I was somebody who could have one glass of wine or two glasses of wine I would do it you know 
I would absolutely that life would be lovely life would be easy <laughs> but it's not not the case yeah. sadly not the case yeah no um that's all really great thank you um the last bit is just any online resources or resources in general you'd recommend to people if you can't think of any off the top of your head we can just um send that out separately but um if you've got any kind of organizations or stuff you want to shout out while we're online I think for me the issue is that I look at so many that I never remember the names so I'm gonna step back on this one <laughs> yeah so I mean, yeah I mean again Google is is your friend on this one really but like ADHD aware uh, they're based in Brighton but they do peer support meetings for partners of people with ADHD um, and I think it's once a month on Zoom um, and I think that's probably because I'm not a, a parent the, the biggest impact of my ADHD has been on partners um, of mine. Um, and I think it is really important for that understanding. I think there's a lot more maybe available for parents of children with ADHD, because for a start, if, if it's picked up at school and there's I know that there's Facebook, there's a West Yorkshire Facebook peer support group, for example, which is pretty good for ADHD. But a lot of it is very much like parents saying I can't cope with with my child. I'm still waiting for the assessment and then other parents helping. But I think being in a romantic relationship with somebody, um, living with somebody who has ADHD, it's yeah important to understand. And it's like any kind of peer support is so validating. And if they hear something that someone else says that their partner does that drives them crazy and they want to be more empathic, I think that can be really, really beneficial. That sounds great. I'll make sure to include the link when I send that out. Um, and if you guys want to send me any other links that you think of, I'll also get some research together and make sure that's all sent out with this. Um, right. But that's all the questions now. Um, thanks so much for joining me for, I guess, an hour the recording's been. Um, have you got anything else you want to add before we head off? I'd just like to say thank you so much. Um, and Sophie, thank you. Honestly, <laughs> I can't tell you how lovely, if that's the right word, it's been to hear, you know, just almost like a mirror image of, of my experiences as well. Um, but the, the last thing I'd like to add is one thing that I found, or not found, should I say, online is support for women who have ADHD, who have children, because mm -hmm. parenting, when you have ADHD, is so tough. So I am looking at setting up maybe just a Facebook page even but somewhere where parents who have ADHD themselves can go and say oh I, you know I was making dinner before one kid was shouting this at me the other was saying this and I got overwhelmed and I shouted am I a terrible parent because we all do it um because the ADHD really does affect parenting it really really does and it's about making sure that we're looking after ourselves and our children in the healthiest ways possible so yeah um, if anyone's interested in that, please do message me and I'll I'll hook you up. That's brilliant. I mean, if you end up doing that and you want us to share it, I'm sure Sophie will share it in the Neurodiversity Network and I can share it through Touchstone and beyond. So do let us yeah. know. That sounds great. Yeah, absolutely. I think from me, Sarah, yeah, it's, I'm really glad, Bella, that you're to join us and I wanted there to be two, two of us. And it's, yeah, that it, it's a visible sort of portrayal of the peer support and the validation that goes on regardless of the diagnosis the shared experience that matters um in terms of like challenging misconceptions i just think it's about representation um and people feeling empowered to speak up i remember when i got my diagnosis and i said to our fan oh i really want to talk to the organization about this i feel like i need to share this and he said yeah absolutely this is time for you to take your power back sophie like this is you know no longer about what's wrong why you're different but actually and the amount of people when I made this video back in January I think it was um with my cat photo bombing as she does bless her Minnie she's not here today at Touchstone House sadly but um uh, the amount of people that got in touch with especially women um to to talk about it and I think the more people that are comfortable to talk about it and their individual experiences the better um and just to break that down like um there is a, a resource um for women um with ADHD it's a podcast I'll find it so you can send it out Sarah but like one of the you know there's there's women in there who are who are chief executives there are women you know the people that are on paper successful or you know high achievers or super women and they are debunking all of those kind of myths so I think just people being comfortable and knowing that it's safe for them to talk about it is going to help break down the misconceptions I think 
Oh, that's so great. Thank you. Yeah, do make sure to send it over and I'll add it to all the list of things to send out. Um, thank you both so much for joining. I thank have you. learned so much. It's been really helpful and just lush to chat with you both in general. So thanks so much. And thank um, you. I'll, uh, I'll make sure this is all sent out to everyone soon.